Hello and welcome to 18WJTS Inform. As we are every Friday, we're honored to have in the studio with us State Senator Mark Mesmer, representing District 48. Senator, welcome to the show. Great to be here as always. Uh, it's always good to have you, and we really do appreciate you taking the time every Friday to my, come in. My pleasure. What, let's talk about what happened this week in, okay. uh, in the Senate. Okay, this week in the, in the Senate, starting on Monday, we ramped up, and, and it, this was a week of all committee work. We did have three bills that passed early in the week in committee that we finished you know, the floor amending on uh, yesterday. So this week was primarily committees and a lot of committee activities. I mean, I had five bills in committee this week, you know, House bills that I'm, that I'm sponsoring. So it was busy and, and all of the committees were pretty much loaded up with, with activities. So we're you know, trying to process through a sh in a short session. We only have another week and a half of, of committee time left. Okay. So uh, you know, if, if things are gonna move, they gotta move you know, pretty quickly. Now, I, I heard something that this week there was a, a bill concerning Muncie and Gary schools, mm -hmm. and I know that they're having some financial difficulties. But then there's also the bill about all schools in Indiana are going to get more money. Correct. There, there, there are two, two different two things, different right? bills, okay. yes. House okay. Bill 1001, and when, when the House puts a, and House or Senate, when you ha have a low numbered bill, you know, especially with House bills 1001 through, you know, 1009, I mean, those are they consider those their you know priority issues mm -hmm. that they're wanting to try to move and 1001 is the supplemental funding we had a senate bill that passed the first half as well i don't don't remember the number on that one uh, both those bills passed you know the, their respective chambers we had 1001 come out of committee uh, on wednesday i believe uh, by a vote of 9 to 0 out of appropriation so it's moving on to the floor next week for final passage but that's to supplement schools with, with the additional, I mean, there was several thousand more kids showed up for school this year than, than what the school corporations had, you know, told us they thought they were gonna have. And, you know, usually the, the targets don't miss by much. I mean, it was enough that we're gonna do a, a extra budget appropriation this year. So House Bill 1001, you know, passed out unanimously out of the House Committee, House Floor, I think all 100 House members are co-authors of the bill, so obviously it's pretty it's important. Gonna it's yeah. going to pass. Okay. It'll probably pass unanimously when it gets to the floor next week. So that, that one cleared, and another one they had was House Bill 1003 uh, that, that cleared out of uh, local government this week, and, and that one is a streamlining of reporting. And, and right now the Office of Management and Budget, they said they're estimated that they do about 2,000 different financial reports on d different agencies and different rules and and about 1,995 of those don't get read by anybody. So I mean it's going to eliminate a lot of their their reporting that really I mean they're doing these reports they're spending you know millions of dollars in the OMB crunching out these reports and sending them out to different agencies and different committees and, di and, and nothing is done with them. So just a duplicative reporting elimination. And cleaning it, up some paperwork. That's, that's right. Less government. I, that good. sounds unusual. OK. <laughs> that's good. Uh, another bill, uh, and, and a few of these passed out of my committee while I, you know, I guess one of them came out of local government on small cells. And on that one, um, we, last year we passed a bill that would streamline the process of, of uh, telecom companies going to cities and towns and, and getting their permits worked out with the local government on placement of, of antennas and placement of poles and, and how much the cities could charge for those. Uh, and there was a drafting error that, that allowed, you know, cities and towns or counties to, to pass, an, you know, uh, most of them were just resolutions claiming their whole city or town was underground only. Well, that basically voided the bill mm -hmm. that we did for, you know, for 60 places across the state. and was really, you know, not intended that, that you know, that they were going to have the ability to do that. So this bill basically redefined, you know, the areas that are underground only, if there's neighborhood associations, if there's commercial areas, if there's residential areas that had, had been set up to be, you know, underground utility, you know, areas, those areas would be, you know, maintained with that, that, that status going forward. But Obviously, if there's areas where there's overhead, you know, wiring and, and poles now, uh, those areas were, you know, that those resolutions were unenforceable in those areas. And that was a bill that I had the companion Senate bill, the House bill passed first. So I had pulled my Senate bill off the calendar. Uh, this bill came to me and it passed um, by a pretty wide margin in the House. The uh, 
the Cities and Towns Association, you know, supports the bill. That, you know, they said, yes, this really gets us to where we all thought we were at mm -hmm. the end of last year. And, and um, moved out of committee this week at 9 to 2. So, you know, pretty strong support, bipartisan support on that one. Uh, and, and that'll be off to the floor next week for, you know, final amending and, and voting. Don't anticipate any amendments on that. Uh, you know, nobody came to committee to speak against the bill. You know, I mean, and that was pretty carefully crafted with the tele telecommunication companies, the electric companies, and, and you know, local government representatives to, to get it in the spot that it's at. So good fix on that one. Uh, a bill that I heard and was about an hour and a half hearing, I scheduled a pretty long hearing to allow a lot of time for it because it was a, really a pretty important bill dealing with uh, allowing the Indiana to move into the commercial growing of industrial hemp. In 2013, we passed a bill while the federal government was working on some legalization of, of, of that bill that year was actually authored by um, Senator Young, you know, from mm -hmm. the, the prior, you know, from over near Milltown. Uh, he had wrote that, you know, written that bill, and it, it allowed Purdue uh, and, you know, and, you know, the uh, universities to start doing research on, on hemp seed and kind of got the hemp seed, you know, pilot program started so they can grow it, they can an analyze the seeds, you know, analyze different traits. There's, there's hemp that's grown for the fiber content, for rope, for clothing, for uh, a replacement for fiberglass in, in high, you know, high strength. It's, it's lighter weight and stronger than, you know, than, than fiberglass. And, and so there's a lot of companies in Indiana already buying, you know, tons of this product. I think one, one company in northern Indiana buys, I think he said, you know, 400 tons a year. I mean, just bunches of it that, that they, they use to make um, high strength, high tech door panels. The RV industry wants that for, you know, you know, use in their product. But all of that that we get now in the United States is grown in Canada, Germany, and China. Um, so in uh, 2014, the federal government said uh, under the agriculture bill that year that any any hemp product and, and it could be classified as hemp and not you know, not marijuana which is a, a cousin plant you know similar but uh, anything that had less than 0.3 percent THC you know is classified as hemp anything more than that is, is classified as, as marijuana and and anything that complies with that you know you, that they allowed the process of starting the the, uh, the seed research and the growth uh, you know growth research of it um, Kentucky was really ahead of the game. That, you know, they not only passed the, the, the seed provision of it that we had in 2013, they set up, you know, the commercial growing uh, rules. And, th and that's what uh, House Bill 1137 does is really copies what Kentucky has done on, on the, the boards that monitor it, the, the, the inspections by state police, the testing requirements for the product. Uh, we had one of the growers from Kentucky who was really instrumental and working with uh, Senator McConnell to get the 2014 Farm Bill, you know, to, to legalize it. And then, then part of one of the budget bills, I think in 2016, you know, refined some more of the rules, you know, on, on how, you know, and, and the, the processes of getting, you know, DEA waivers, you know, for the product that's below 0.3, you know, 0.3%, which is uh, low enough that it, it can't be a, used as a, as a hallucinogenic drug. And, and him, you know, working with federal authorities, him working with the federal government and Kentucky's, you know, statute that, that, that they set up, we're, you know, really copying the bulk of what they've done. And, and this will allow uh, commercial growers, they'll have to have, they'll have to have an end purchaser, you know, uh, you know, a memorandum of understanding, you know, contract set up that everything they grow has a, has a, you know, a destination, mm -hmm. you know, before they start to grow it, they have to test. Each field, you know, in, in, you know, the guy in Kentucky said, he says, as an example, I had a thousand acre, you know, plot last year, and they have to test every acre of it. And he said, I had four acres that tested at 0.4 percent THC, and we had to destroy it. So it has to, has to be below 0.3 percent, okay. and and so they the they have to set up GPS coordinates so the state police know exactly where it's at. They come in and monitor it, you know, minimum a couple times a year you know, to, to check it, to test it, to, you know, and, and, and then before, you know, when they harvest, you know, if a, if a batch tests out higher than 0.3, they have to, have to destroy it. So he said last year they had 1,000 acres planted, 996 that, you know, that they 
uh, sent into production, and production processing facilities have, sp have sprouted up all over within about a 100-mile uh, circle in Kentucky of where the growers are and where the processors of that, that hemp into either protein, you know, you know, food sources, or oils, or fiber content for industrial use. And hemp ropes are still used today by the, by the U.S. Navy you know, for on, on every battleship. Uh, I mean, hemp is still heavily used, but we've not been allowed to grow it in the United States since about the 1930s. Okay. So that bill passed out of committee eight to three, and uh, strong bipartisan support. Actually, the three that voted no, you know, were three of our attorneys uh, on my committee, and and they, they were they were more concerned that, and, and they still, they're you know they're they're and the prosecutors association did not speak against the bill, but. They're, they're concerned it's going to be a loophole to medical, medical marijuana, mm -hmm. which it, sure. you know, because of the testing, because of the point three limit, I mean, it can't be. So, I mean, it's really, it, and, and there's companies all across Indiana that use the product already, you know, tons of the product that, and, and this will this will really put Indiana, you know, I mean, we're a few years behind Kentucky on seed development and, and on, but he said really, <clears throat> geographically, the most, uh, common place that most of this has grown is in, a, in an area of, of uh, China and it said geographically you know the, the 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 type of weather they have there and the type of weather we have he said actually Kentucky and southern Indiana you know the you know closer to the river is the ideal top I mean the, the ideal climate you know to grow to grow hemp and, and really the it's a value-added product in the in the you know hilly areas of southern Indiana. There are some areas that are just limited to pasture, mm -hmm. you know, areas now because of the, you know the potential for erosion, that, you know, with corn and soybeans. He said it's really an, an ideal product, and 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 some of those folks that are more on the southeast side of the state, you know, would be able to tie directly in because that's the area of uh, K Kentucky that has really kind of hit the you know the center of mass of of the current growers. Uh, it would allow them to 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 bring it on, on board pretty quickly and connect to those processing plants that aren't really, you know, not that far away uh, in Kentucky now. And we'd like to see that grow and have some of those processing facilities show up here. I mean, they've got, I think, 200 companies that, that utilize that product that's grown in Kentucky now. They're anticipating, I think this year they had about 4,000 acres, um, and they're anticipating, you know, closer to 10,000 acres of, of hemp to be grown uh, this year in Kentucky. And they have permits for up to 12, but obviously some of that, you know, some of that has to, the customers have to be lined up, the growers have to actually, you know, get it in the ground and grow it. But they're, they're anticipating that hemp will exceed uh, tobacco in, mm -hmm. in volume in Kentucky this year. I mean, still, Kentucky is still a, a pretty popular area for, area for tobacco growing, but it's, you know, it's been declining and, and they expect that that to, to be the, you know, overtake that in terms of dollar volume this year. Okay. So, uh, last bill that I worked on that took a lot of work, and uh, for the last 30 years, the chiropractors haven't had an update in their code. And long overdue, a lot of things have changed in, in education requirements and, and technology, you know, and, and for that field, um, they were long overdue for an update. Uh, it, it took really until Monday of this week to get the, the osteopaths, the MDs, the, and, and the, the Occupational and physical therapists had we had tweaked the bill while it was on the House side enough to where they were they were neutral on the bill and, and this week was able to get uh, confirmed from the osteopaths and the MDs after our meeting on the, you know, with them on Monday that they were officially neutral on the bill and and for those organizations to be neutral is a big deal yeah. um, so that bill passed out of committee today or on Thursday morning 10-0 okay. and off to the floor for final vote next week. So next week's going to be a full activity. However, next week we're going to have you come in and talk about, do a little, little one-on-one yep. on, on government. We talk a lot about bills and passing out of committee or not doing this, not doing that, or they pass here. And when do they become effective? We're going to talk about, uh, let's kind of wrap that up, okay. kind of give an idea of, of how legislation actually happens. That sounds great. All right. Well, Senator, thank right. you very much You're for welcome. coming in. My pleasure. Our guest has been State Senator Mark Mesmer. He is for District 48 here in Southwest Indiana. Thank you for watching WJTS Inform. Join us again next week. Mark will be back to talk about legislation and how it actually happens. Thank you for watching. We're local people watching local people.